All right, welcome back. In this last video, we're going to look at filtering and differentiation. Recall our inverse dynamic analysis. So we have our measurements here. We've talked about inverse kinematics. Now we have this d by dt block, which is differentiation, in order to get joints, angular velocities, and angular accelerations. Now there are some things we need to consider before doing this numerical differentiation. Here's an example signal. So there's a signal component here with an amplitude of 20 and a noise component with an amplitude of 1. So the signal to noise ratio is 20. We can tell where the signal is. It has a, a frequency of 1 hertz. And there's some you know, low amplitude noise, some ripple there. It's not too noticeable. What happens if we differentiate? Well, you can differentiate this symbolic expression. You'd end up with this one here. And we find that we now have a signal part with an amplitude of 40 and a noise part with an amplitude of 20. So our signal to noise ratio has gone from 20 down to 2. And you can see that in the trace here. The squiggles in the blue line are now more pronounced. What if we took another derivative? Here, suppose this was position. This would be velocity. Now if we have accelerations, the signal to noise ratio drops again. So now we have a signal to noise ratio of only 0.2. And you'll see that the noise is actually dominating the signal. So how do we get around this? Well, one thing we could do is filter our signal before taking a derivative. So here's an example of a filter. We need to decide on, critically, what is the transition band, or what's the filter cutoff frequency. Okay, So we have a low-pass uh, filter here. On the low-frequency range, we have a magnitude that's around 1. In the high-frequency range, we have a very low magnitude, which means that when we apply the filter, any parts of the signal that have high frequency will end up with very low amplitude. How do we choose our cutoff frequency? Ideally, we'll have signal that's in one frequency range and noise that's in another frequency range. So ideally, we can find kind of the best of both worlds and put our filter cutoff frequency in between the signal and the noise. So we want to retain as much low frequency content here, which is where the signal is, and remove as much high frequency content, which is where the noise is. The catch is that in certain activities, the signal and the noise have very similar frequencies. Here are some common activities with their frequencies uh, of interest. So postural sway and walking, these have relatively low frequencies. The heel strike transient during running has fairly high frequency content. So you would have to pick your uh, cutoff frequency of a filter with that in mind. There are many sources of error. We talked a little bit about soft tissue artifacts. It's probably the worst source of error in most motion capture experiments. And that tends to be in the frequency range right around what we care about. So this tends to be a rather difficult one to filter out. But it's good to be aware of the noise components in your signals before you do a numerical analysis on them. So to recap this sequence of videos, we asked why do we want to quantify movement. We showed some examples for why it's important to have measurements of someone's movement. We focused primarily on optical motion capture and force plates. These are the two most common uh, methods for collecting data in the lab. And we looked at selecting a model and focused on the details of the calculations of inverse kinematics. And now we just briefly talked about filtering and differentiation. Coming up next, in chapters 8 and 9, we'll move on to computing net joint moments and ultimately the muscle forces that must have been present to produce an observed motion. So I'll see you there.